Good afternoon and welcome to the Society of Wetland Scientists second webinar of 2021 entitled Assessing Vegetative Species Recolonization of Commercial Cranberry Bogs, which will be presented by Kate McPherson. My name is Katie Christie and I'm pleased to moderate this webinar and engage you in an e-learning experience with SWS during a time when many of us are looking for virtual opportunities to stay engaged. This is one way to stay connected to the wetland community during the global pandemic, and we hope you all are well. For those of you who may not be as familiar with our SWS webinar series, our monthly webinars are usually held on the third Thursday of the month at 1 p.m. Eastern time. As you can see on this listing of our upcoming webinars, we have both our regular SWS webinar series in English and also have quarterly webinars offered in Spanish which are open to members and non-members alike. Our webinars are also posted to YouTube for free viewing, and we have an amazing library of over 60 different webinars that, that are getting a lot of playtime during the pandemic. Another expansion of our program is the development of wetland interviews. Make sure you keep that on your radar. We are proud to recognize our SWS webinar series sponsors for 2021. First up, we have the Winton Group, which is a natural resource consulting firm that balances regulatory compliance with sound ecological management. You can find their information at the website listed above. Also, we'd like to recognize in situ. In situ monitoring equipment and software works together to make it an easier and more cost effective to collect, access, and manage data on water levels, water quality, and water flow, and more and WildNote, which is a data field collection app for environmental professionals that streamlines the process of collecting, managing, and reporting environmental data so that you can work smarter, not harder. Please visit, like, and follow our SWS webinar sponsors. We've had a successful first year of webinar sponsorship in 2020, and we have just two sponsorship slots left for 2021. Webinar sponsors receive recognition and webinar promotional items, including emails and advertisement on the SWS webinar webpage, verbal recognition during our live webinars, as you just heard, and sustained exposure on, from on-demand webinars. The annual sponsorship rate is just $1,000 for the entire year. So please contact Jordan Hag as soon as possible to partner with SWS and, and to bring important and relevant information to the wetland community. Since January 2018, we've gone through the process of having our SWS webinars pre-approved by the SWS Professional Certification Program as being applicable or being applied to your professional wetland scientist certification or renewal or other certifications. Uh, we have applied for the pre-approval for this webinar as well. Uh, it seems even more important during the pandemic to gather as many uh, continuing education credits um, as you can from online or virtual training sessions like these SWS webinars. Participation certificates for watching the webinar in its entirety are available through an automated process. You will receive an email from our, uh, from our own Susanna Hagendorn via Zoom about one day after the webinar. Please check your spam email if you don't see it. These certificates are free to SWS members and participation certificates are also available for those who watch webinar recordings uh, which can be found on our events calendar page or on our YouTube channel. Um, let's see. Next slide, housekeeping. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, the general format for today's webinar will be a 45 minute presentation by our speaker, followed by approximately 15 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, all attendees will be muted for the duration of the webinar. I just want to remind our speaker to make sure that they mute their microphone and turn off their video camera when not speaking. Questions and answers. Uh, questions will be asked with the Q&A button shown here, not in the chat button. The chat button will be reserved for technical difficulties monitored by SWS staff. At any time during the presentation, you can type your questions into the Q&A uh, button or pane. Participants may upvote questions in the Q&A that they want to be answered earlier. As your moderator, I will pose the questions I receive in the Q&A pane to the speaker. A survey will be sent to you via email from Zoom one day after the webinar. Please fill that out to give us feedback. 
about today's webinar and the SWS webinar program. Additionally, please indicate if you'd be interested in giving a future SWS webinar in 2021. So Kate McPherson is Save the, Bay, Save the Bay's near Gansett Bay Riverkeeper. She's a professional wetland scientist who's passionate about wetland and river restoration, engaging community members to take steps to improve watershed health and using sound science to inform policy. Kate has a uh, bachelor's in wildlife, wildlife biology and management from the University of Rhode Island. And before joining Save the Bay, she spent 14 years working in the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management's Office of Water Resources, Freshwater Wetlands Permitting Program, where she reviewed potential impacts of proposed projects on wetland resources. And with that, I will hand over control to Kate. Welcome, Kate. Thanks, Katie. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to hear about a project that I completed in 2019 and 2020. Uh, the site here is Millbrook, um, Millbrook Bog, which is in Massachusetts. And this project was a partnership between Save the Bay, which is the nonprofit that I work for, uh, the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, which is the current landowner, and Massachusetts Department of Ecological Restoration, which is a state agency whose sole charge is wetland restoration. Um, it's really an exciting group to be part of. Um, a little bit of Save the Bay. Our mission is to protect and improve Narragansett Bay. We want a fishable, swimmable bay that is accessible to everyone. And in order to have a bay that is fishable and swimmable, we definitely need to look at watershed impacts. Um, so my official title is the Narragansett Bay Riverkeeper. I'm a member of the Waterkeeper Alliance and Save the Bay is uh, an affiliate group of Waterkeeper Alliance. And so I am also a part of, so Save the Bay is a member supported nonprofit and we have three primary areas where we work uh, in advocacy, in education, and in habitat restoration. And so I'm a member of the advocacy team, but I also do a lot of habitat restoration due to my background as a wetland scientist. So where are we? The Society of Wetland Scientists is a global group. Um, we are on the East Coast of the United States and Narragansett Bay has a bi-state watershed, uh, the Northern portion of Rhode Island and the Southeastern portion of Massachusetts uh, drains to Narragansett Bay. And we are in the Southeastern portion of Narragansett, uh, of, of Massachusetts, um, in a town called Freetown in the watershed of the Taunton River. And we're at the northern portion of the southeastern Massachusetts Bioreserve. And this is a unique area because it's the largest and least fragmented natural landscape in coastal Massachusetts. It's about 16,000 acres of mostly protect of land that is mostly protected in perpetuity. So it's kind of a big deal for a really um, highly urbanized section of the East Coast to have this really large area of land preserved in perpetuity. Um, and then thinking about cranberry bogs in the watershed. And so I wanna make this distinction between a farmed area of land as a cranberry bog, as a cranberry farm, and then thinking about bogs and fens in our natural wetland habitats and how um, many decades ago, some of these bogs are hundreds of years old. Uh, some of these farmed bog areas are hundreds of years old. They went to these natural areas where cranberries, which is a species that's related to a blueberry or, or a huckleberry. It's in the um, Galaceae, uh, in the vaccinium family. And uh, thinking about this crop, this commercial crop that is grown in wetlands and how natural wetland systems have been modified to grow this crop. So this map here that we're looking at is Southeastern Massachusetts. Um, I'm gonna trace with my arrow, hopefully you can see my pointer here, but we're, this is a, an outline of the Taunton River watershed. All of the orange locations are a, 
abandoned cranberry bogs. So in this portion of southeastern Massachusetts, we have 307 acres of cranberry bogs that are no longer in operation and have been abandoned by farmers. Um, we also have an additional 300 acres of bogs that are not abandoned yet, but they're just not being farmed. And there's a variety of um, of pressures on farmers in Massachusetts for why they might choose to stop farming. Uh, it's related to the cost of land in uh, New England and just pressure, like cranberries are being grown in other areas of the world now. And um, so it's just not profitable for some of these farmers. Um, but we still have over 3000 acres of active cranberries, cranberry farms. And so this is our site that we're going to talk about this afternoon. Uh, this is Millbrook Bog. You can see I have an aerial photograph in the bottom left from 2004 when the bog was in full production. If you look at these smooth textured cells, there's eight different growing bog cell areas and Millbrook winds its way north through the, through the uh, cranberry growing fields here. And then I have an, in the middle, we have a, an aerial photograph from April of 2013, where, which is the last year that the bogs were in commercial production. And you can see there's a little, the, the reddish hue is actually the cranberry plants themselves or the cranberries ripening. Um, and then you can see this pretty significant shift in the wetland immediately to the south of the farmed area between 2013 and 2014. And so this is when, uh, Millbrook bog was, so it, it, it was previously farmed by a farmer. Um, and then through the United States Department of Agriculture Natural Resource Conservation Service, they put a, what's called a wetland reserve easement on the land. And then through that, Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game was able to take ownership of the land. And then once, and this area is pretty large, it's 127 acres of just farmed area. And once the state took, o took over the ownership, then it was able to um, go forward with restoration, wetland restoration. Um, this project has half a mile of, or not the project, the, the bog, the growing, former growing area has a half a mile of dike, which acts as a dam creating this impoundment south of, of, of the bog here. And you can see when the batter board, boards, which are the structures that control the water level were removed, um, right away, we have an emergent marsh coming in in this area. Whoop, too many slides, here we go. So uh, like I said, 60 areas, 60 acres of potentially a wetland, maybe there was a little bit of upland mixed in there, but 60 acres of growing fields uh, were in operation for, for decades here. Um, and then an additional, or not say 130 acres were, op were in operation for, for many decades. And then 60 additional acres of wetland were impacted hydrologically. So we wanna make this distinction between the farmed cranberry air, cranberry growing areas, the cranberry bogs, and then the wetlands that have been impacted by this farming activity. So even though machines were never uh, driving around in this marsh uh, or physical alterations, there wasn't any dumping, there wasn't any filling, it was just purely hydrological changes. They changed the water regime in this marsh to the south. I was interested in seeing how that wetland area was affected by the legacy farming in the larger, you know, 130 acre uh, farm area. And you can see sort of like the, the bones of a cranberry operation. You can see um, all these horizontal striations. Those are the cranberry fields. And you can see these little lines, parallel lines. Those are the internal ditches. And that's uh, was used for uh, water control, making sure that the water because cranberries are a native plant in New England and they're a wetland plant, they're a wetland obligate species. And so thinking about trying to keep the, the water level optimal for growth. And then when cranberries are harvested, the entire area is flooded and cranberries are raked um, downstream and, and then harvested in, in big buckets. And so water control is really important. 
And so then I got involved in this project when a colleague of mine told me about this planned restoration out here on Millbrook Bog. And the bog growing surface had been abandoned for six growing seasons. And this is a, the, the main photograph that you're looking at is six growing seasons worth of revegetation. And you can see there is a surprising amount of species diversity. Um, and the growth is, is pretty, pretty fast for an area that is nutrient poor, typically. Um, a lot of these, a lot of this is early succession. We have saplings, we've got shrubs, and then the inset photograph is just a photograph of what a, a commercial cranberry bog that is in operation might look at look like. Um, and cranberry vines are low, compact; they don't get taller than six inches or so. Um, and farmers have to do some some pretty regular maintenance to prevent other species from coming in and colonizing. So in the summer of 2019, uh, I did a reconnaissance visit with my colleague, Aby Monroy, formerly of Mass DER. She very recently left uh, Mass Department of Ecological Restoration. Uh, she was in the Cranberry Bog Restoration Program. They have a whole program dedicated to revitalizing former uh, cranberry bogs that were used to grow cranberries agriculturally and trying to get them to resemble more natural fog and pen <laughs> fen and bog habitats. Um, and so as we were out on the site and walking and talking, we were seeing all these really great species. We were seeing leather leaf in the ditches. I saw some pieces of, of some individuals of bog cotton. I saw uh, saplings of Atlantic white cedar swamp or Atlantic white cedar. And these are species that you just, you just don't see in a, in a, highly disturbed area. And so I was getting really excited. I was like, wow, like, why are all these plants recolonizing relatively soon after, after the farming activity has stopped? And we got to thinking and we got to talking about what the goals of any pre-vegetation monitoring were going to be. Um, and so I, I actually, I asked them some pretty hard questions because um, they just sort of said, we want, a monitoring pro a monitoring protocol and they definitely were interested in knowing whether or not they had an invasive a non-native invasive species problem what and where generally those were and whether or not they would need to incorporate some special uh you know management techniques to to control the spread of those um they also wanted to know if there were any unique plant assemblages that they should uh, try to avoid. So for example, if natural bog was forming in a corner of the wetland that, or, or a corner of the former growing area, like should they just leave that alone and not um, do any specific restoration techniques? Um, and so they had a lot of questions and, and I really wanted to, get them thinking about you know the the answers or the questions that they wanted to ask and so some some of the things that it's helpful to think about what are some of the wetland restoration techniques that they were considering in asking these questions so for example and i'm just going to flip back to a picture of uh the aerial filling these perimeter ditches so the there are really large approximately 12 feet wide perimeter ditches uh, all along the outside of the former growing surface. They also want to remove farm roads. So these light colored lines in the aerial photograph and this light, light color, colored line that goes down along Mill Brook, those are all farm roads. And those roads are approximately 50 feet wide from Tove Slope to Tove Slope. And they're really tall, They're they're like, at least 10 feet tall from base elevation to the crest of the road. So there's a lot of material there to sort of move around. Thinking about removing large culverts in the river. So there are culverts or wetland crossings at five separate sections of Mill Brook throughout this, this property. And the fewer wetland crossings we have, the better hydrologically it'll be for the river better for aquatic co connectivity, uh, organisms moving, don't love to move through culverts no matter how big they are. Um, and then breaking up the sand layer. So in order to farm a 
naturally quaky, highly organic uh, area, farmers would spread sand. So every year they'd spread, spread a new layer of sand that also helped with weed suppression. So any of those, the recolonizing that I was talking about earlier. Um, and then the cranberries can grow in the sand and the farmers can manipulate the water level in the sand pretty easily. So over the course of many decades, we have like three feet of sand on a surface. And if you dig down, you'll get to a really nice peaty, mucky organic layer. If you just remove the sand with a backhoe, you'll end up with an open water impoundment because that organic layer has been crushed uh, for so long. So thinking about how we're gonna restore this area um, informs you know, how we're going to develop the, the, a wetland monitor, a, a plant monitoring plan. And so we could have looked at things like species richness, which is sure, but that doesn't really tell you anything about like what kind of plants are growing on, on the bog. They just tell you how many. Um, we could have asked questions about percent native, but I knew from my pre-reconnaissance work that, you know, it looked like there were a lot of native plants recolonizing. I didn't see a lot of Phragmites coming in or um, other non-native invasive species to the region. Um, and we could have used something like a rapid assessment model, um, but that wasn't really plant focused. It was more of a, a GIS analysis. Um, and they were really hard to compare. There, there wasn't a good framework to compare it against. And so when I spoke with some of my colleagues uh, in the Rhode Island Natural History Survey that have been working on wetland assessments for the better part of this decade, uh, for more than a decade, um, my colleague Tom Kutcher recommended floristic quality assessment. And so FQA stands on this premise that each plant has a coefficient of conservatism, so a CC value. And basically all that, the, the CC value measures is the uniqueness of the plant. So something like this beautiful bog laurel has a pretty high CC value, the highest um, that you, that the value, it ranges from zero, which would be a non-native invasive species uh, to nine, which would be our most unique uh, coolest plants, some might say. Um, tussock sedge is uh, a cool wetland plant, but a little bit more common and not found in unique, unusual habitats. And so, like I said, when we were doing our recon in the summer of, of 2019, I was seeing things like this bog cotton, and I was seeing things like this Atlantic white cedar. And I knew that they were valuable, cool plants. Um, and then the CC values, these coefficients of conservatism uh, also reflected that. Now, CC values are developed regionally or by state bot botanists uh, that go and, you know, they know the plant communities that are located in their states. Uh, a lot of, I know that a lot of work had gone into Rhode Island's uh, catalog of, of plants, the CC values for Rhode Island. Um, I knew a little bit less about the CC values in Massachusetts. Uh, so for this project, we decided to, to go with Rhode Island values of coefficients of conservatism, even though we're in Massachusetts. Uh, and the region, the reason for that was I was, I was more comfortable with the, the robustness of those values for Rhode Island and also eco-regionally, southeastern Massachusetts, the entirety of Rhode Island, we're all in the New England coastal zone. So there's not a whole lot. If, if Rhode Island didn't have a, a CC value for a specific plant, for example, I just use the eco-regional value. Um, and so methods, we have a huge site. We're, we're talking, you know, 130 acres of, of plants to, to, to go count. So we kind of kept it simple. We had a hundred meter transect tape and we threw the transect down. And when we walked th that transect out, I sort of looked on either side to get a, a feel for, okay, what's in this transect and approximately how like abundance levels. We had three abundance bins. We had scarce, common and dominant. Dominant was greater than 60%. Common was 10 to 60%. Scarce was less than 10%. Um, and then I just walked backwards and I had a field assistant who's a budding wetland scientist. She learned a ton about wetland plants uh, and was super excited to sit down with me and, and key out plants. Here's a picture of, of my assistant, Shannon. 
uh, entering data. We direct entered our data into spreadsheets in the fields. Um, when I was an undergrad, that's not how we did it. And there was an awful lot of boring sitting in, um, in the office and trying to accurately represent your data. We did a lot of keying out. Uh, we were able to key out all of the species in the field, which is great. We didn't have to bring too much back to the lab and, and try to key it out. Um, and so we put a transect in one transect in each of these uh, former the bog cells, the, the grow, growing areas. For really big bog cells, we put in like an extra transect. And then we also put in um, two transects in that wetland that we talked about earlier that was just hydrologically impacted and not physically impacted by the, by the farming operation here. But still, there, how do you know when to stop? <laughs> you know, it's a big site. We can keep going, collecting data forever. Uh, so we used just a simple uh, level of effort measurement to sort of show that with each new transect, we were getting fewer and fewer unique plants. And so I would, the transects are not random. I would, I specifically would place a new transect uh, if I saw a plant that hadn't been captured in any of the other transects. So as you can see from this graphic here, our first transect, you know, all of the species were unique. Um, with the second transect, you know, we got like a couple more. With the third, we got looks like eight more. With the fourth, we got a few more. And and so on. We ended up with 11 transects in the former growing area. But then in the hydrologically impacted wetlands, um, we really weren't getting too many unique plants with the second transect. Um, and I knew I wanted to save time on this project, or not save time, but I wanted to go back out in other growing seasons. Our first round of data collection was in November of 2019. And I knew we were missing a lot of plants because we wanted to be able to accurately identify sedges and um, sort of the fall flowering plants, but anything that all the solid day goes, goldenrods, asters were pretty much toast. And um, I wanted to try and be able to identify all those as well. So, so we went back out in uh, June, in May and June, April, May and June of 2020, where we had a, a pandemic to deal with. So I um, had to beg. <laughs> there was a lot of there was a lot of um, gnashing of teeth and. Uh, a lot of concern and worry about trying to make it work. If you're interested in the story of how Save the Bay made it work interpersonally, you can check out Save the Bay. I wrote a blog post about this uh, this spring and um, getting our volunteer coordinator who you can see here uh, to help me out with, with the project due to COVID restrictions. But talking about results. And so the nice thing about using an FQA, and I alluded to a little bit earlier, but you can come up with a number. And an FQA, basically all we did was we have all, we, we took some a, a little bit of spatial data. So we know generally how common, how scarce, how dominant the different plants were on the bog. Um, and then we, so we could do a weighted mean CC or just a straight mean CC. Um, and there's there's not a, a really big difference between between the two. Uh, in fact, recent published data from my colleague Tom Kutcher in 2018, he looked at a bunch of different wetland indicator um, assessment methods. He looked at an odonate method. He looked at the Rhode Island RIRAM, Rhode Island Rapid Assessment Method, uh, and sort of you know looked at the the differences between them and whether or not a particular wetland using these different wetland ass assessments, you know, would come up with different values. So, um, and then he also had developed um, metrics by which we could compare our data to. And so this graph, what we're looking at right here, um, is just box plots. Uh, it's from 20 different wetlands in Rhode Island. Um, the crosses are the min and max values. Um, least disturbed is sort of our most pristine wetlands. Intermittently disturbed, um, 
would be, and, and those concepts, the least disturbed, intermittently disturbed, most disturbed, uh, come from the RIRAM, the R Rhode Island Rapid Assessment Model, which doesn't look at a whole lot of plants and is more of like a whole landscape uh, quality view. And we wanted to, and when we found, when we, when we ran our numbers, and I sort of lost track of my notes here. Do, 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 do. Yes, our farmed bog mean CC is 4.3. And so when you compare that to the intermittently disturbed wetland types, it's like sort of right where you would expect it. Um, I'm actually, I was actually a little bit surprised that it wasn't more disturbed, most disturbed, um, but apparently, you know, six years of, of, of growing season and also I suspect uh, seed from the larger wetland area, you can see just outside of the green here, uh, we have a full intact Atlantic white cedar swamp. Um, and a lot of those seeds are windblown. So we have a really good seed source coming in to recolonize this, this bog area. Um, and then when you compare the hydrologically impacted wetlands, I was actually really surprised that although the, I mean, the wetland plants out here were obliterated by, by the impoundment. And when you go out and you visit the site, there's Atlantic white cedar stumps. It, it's pretty obvious that it was an Atlantic white cedar swamp prior to the impoundment. Um, but you still, you have really unique plants out here. Our mean CC was 4.9 and our weighted mean CC was 5.7. And so I was really hoping to be able to compare our data to unpublished data from my colleague, Tom Kutcher, um, because he had a metric that was specific to fens and bogs, natural fens and bogs, not farmed areas. Um, and when he took an inventory of, I think he looked at at least 25 fens and bogs in the region. Um, intermittent, intermittently disturbed. Oh, oh, here it is. I think I just said the wrong numbers. I apologize, everyone. Our farmed bog is a um, mean CC of four and a weighted mean CC of 3.9. And that falls in intermittently disturbed. Our hydrologically impacted wetland has a mean CC of 5.3 and a weighted mean CC of 5.6. The numbers I said earlier were from, from Tom's unpublished data. So his mean CC for those intermittently disturbed areas were 4.3 or 4.5 respectively. And then least disturbed, so thinking about like super pristine uh, floating bogs or Atlantic white cedar swamps, mean CC was 4.9 and weighted mean CC 5.7. So anything coming close to five is just really, really good quality stuff. And so like I said earlier, our um, Department of Ecological Restoration really wanted to know where invasive species were. And we collected all of this data in the spring. We focused all of our fall data collection on um, getting those transects down and, and really identifying all those plants in, in all 13 of those transects. And so I used a program called Google My Maps. Uh, I love this program, it's free, it's really intuitive, it meshes really well with Google Sheets, and it's hosted online. So, you know, with a web link, you can go and, and uh, click multiflora rose, all the pink multiflora rose spots where we found it will, will light up. You can click on individual data points. If there's a photograph, you can see the photograph. If there's information about how big the patch size was, for the most part, we found individual plants on site and all the non-native invasive species we found were all along the farm roads, which uh, will hopefully be easy to access and easy to control. And so you can see the green outlined area. The green is all of the farm roads that are on site. And we basically walked up and down every farm road and, and took GPS coordinates when we found a non-native invasive. We also spray painted them orange so that anybody who is like a lay person could go out and cut and treat. 
Um, percent native in our farmed area. So our transects did not include any of the farm roads. They just included the formerly farmed area surface of the bog. Um, we mostly found native plants. Uh, of the plants that we found that were non-native, they weren't necessarily considered invasive. We also looked at wetland indicator status um, because why not? You know, let's let's see what's out there. Uh, not really surprising. Uh, the 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 plants that we found in the hydrologically impacted wetlands uh, have a much wetter um, tolerance, more percentage of obligate and, and fac wet species. Um, but there's still an awful lot of obligate and fac wet species in the former growing area, and that's because. Uh, those ditches, those internal and perimeter ditches to those little bog growing cells have um, water throughout the growing season for, for most, most of the growing season. Um, we definitely had some uh, significant limitations to this study in 2019. <laughs> in 2019, we were not able to start data collection due to Tripoli and West Nile virus in the region, which is a mosquito-borne um, disease that can that is potentially fatal to humans. So DER really didn't want us out on site until the first frost. So we had a frost and we lost a bunch of uh, species that we were able to identify. Um, I already talked a little bit about the FQA findings. Um, the flooded wetland FQA being so high was, was pretty exciting um, and just goes to show that physical alterations to wetlands are just way more detrimental than a simple hydrologic alteration. Um, one thing that I haven't talked about at all, you guys heard at the beginning of the talk, I have a degree in wildlife biology and the spotted turtles on site out of control. I've never seen so many spotted turtles in my entire life. Over a hundred <laughs> in the perimeter ditches alone. And spotted turtles aren't necessarily a rare species in Massachusetts, but they're definitely, you know, worth stopping and taking a photograph of. Um, and so some of the, although we were out here to design uh, a vegetation monitoring strategy for DER, we also were out here to to make wildlife observations, to help try and inform the wetland restoration, um, to, to create a project that's going to maximize the wetland benefit, uh, maximize the, the area of, of wetland that can be converted into higher function, higher value, but then also minimize like those individual stressors to wildlife that are already using the site. And so we saw 64 species of birds, including a couple life species for me. And I'm, I'm kind of a, a bird geek. So um, I said, <laughs> my intern who, who uh, came with me in, in the fall is used to that. But our volunteer coordinator, I think, was, was a little shocked at, at the enthusiasm I can muster for birds. Um, 12 species of butterflies. So I don't know a thing about butterflies, but our volunteer coordinator uh, used to do butterfly surveys for Audubon. And so I learned a tremendous amount from her about butterflies on site. And we even found some connections between uh, plants that lance leaf violet that I had a photograph of a couple slides back is an obligate plant pairing for one of the butterflies that we found on site. And so some of our management recommendations are things like, can we keep uh, some of the bog cells, 50% of the bog cells currently in current condition, while 50% of the rest of the site is actively undergoing deconstruction to reconstruct the wetlands. And that's to safeguard uh, wildlife that might have an egg life cycle or a larval life cycle where they can't um, escape a big disaster like a wetland restoration. Amphibians. So although there is a uh, vernal pool very close to the site, just to the west, just to the east of the former bog growing cell area um, that was 
chock full of spotted turtle or spotted salamander and wood frog egg masses. We also found evidence of amphibians, mostly um, spotted salamanders, laying their egg masses in the perimeter ditches. And we don't really know why. Um, we're, um, we're not sure if it's a population sink or not. So we know there's a ton of turtles out there in addition to the, the spotted turtles that I mentioned. Uh, lots of painted turtles, which, which is the region's most common turtle. And then also lots of snapping turtles, uh, which are a significant predator. So uh, snapping turtles would definitely be interested in, in eating eggs. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if they eat amphibian egg masses, but uh, there's definitely predators uh, abounding on site. So we're not sure if, if it's a net gain for them to, to lay there. Um, and then also lots of mammals. I'm definitely not a mammologist, but you know we saw lots of little hopping creatures and burrows and um, lots of prey for some of the the species that that do hunt mammals when we are on site. And so thinking about, I'm going to flip back to um, this aerial photograph here. Actually, I'm going to go back to more so that you can we can get a look at at the. Um, the perimeter ditches. So the green, you can see some of these perimeter ditches. And like I mentioned earlier, they're really wide. They're like 12 feet wide. They're very wet. And that's where we've, we're seeing a lot of these spotted turtles. Um, and so I was thinking to myself, all right, time of year is going to be really important for wetland restoration out here. We don't want to accidentally suffocate turtles if they're buried in the, in the mud hibernating. So I think spring when they're emerging would be a good time before they've laid any eggs. Um, and then thinking about how we fill these perimeter ditches because we're gonna be using the, the fill material from the farm roads and filling from the outside in. So from the Eastern side here and the Western side and fill in towards the river because the river is gonna be the escape route for amphibians to find some you know, temporary refugia until the wetland is restored. Um, so that was one of my recommendations. Thinking about the habitat that's been created here. So we have an early succession habitat, which is a rare habitat type for Southeastern New England, 100%. Um, things like woodcock, um, there's uh, things like grasshopper sparrow, which I which I observed on on site. Um, the site is huge and flat, and there's some grasses and some shrubs. And thinking about, we have a lot of a, a lot of this habitat is just obliterated in our region. And how can we, how can mass wildlife, as the caretaker of the land, continue to foster some of these habitats? Um, after wetland restoration. And so things like rotational mowing, leaving a quarter of the site in early succession habitat for, you know, you know, every six years, every five years, you cut it down, um, leaving some areas of the site mown annually so that we can get um, uh, grassland species like the grasshopper sparrow that I saw on site. There are also vesper sparrows, which are uh, another grassland species. Um, and just thinking about, you know, how can we continue, because the site already supports a ton of really great wildlife, uh, how can we do a wetland restoration that continues to support wildlife? Anytime you do a wetland restoration, a lot of folks' knee-jerk reaction is, oh my goodness, please don't change what's already there. And what, well, we do want to change it for, for water quality purposes, for better habitat purposes. We definitely don't want to um, cause any unnecessary suffering. Stockpiling brush was another one of our recommendations. And this is sort of a recommendation that I probably wouldn't have thought of on my own without my colleague who knows a lot about insects and, and butterflies. And so when you stockpile brush, uh, you can protect eggs and you can protect uh, developing the chrysalis stage of, of butterflies. Um, and folks that work in bogs and fens know that, and Atlantic white cedar swamps, know that there are a number of rare butterfly and moth types that use these habitats that 
that are obligate species to these specific habitats. We did look for some of them um, and we just didn't get lucky. It doesn't mean they're not out here. It means we didn't find them. Um, another thing, collecting seeds in and individual plants. So we found a lot of leather leaf on site uh, growing along these ditches. And so it doesn't make sense to have like a big volunteer effort come out and, you know, dig up some of the rootstock, dig up some of those individual Atlantic white cedars, especially because I know that they are tricky to get, start, get started from seeds and cultivate them, take care of them, and then replant them post-restoration. Um, and then collecting seeds, you know, in the fall when some of our, the more unique seeds are, are ripe, can we go collect them from the bog growing, former bog, former cranberry growing areas and then reseed later. So things like bog cotton or some of the sedge seeds, um, just ideas on how to engage the community and also uh, get a really good wetland restoration. And so with that, here's my contact information. Um, it's a photograph in 2019 when we could do field work without facial coverings. And um, like I said, my colleague, A.B. Monroy has moved on to other, other opportunities. Uh, I've put Alex Hackman's contact information. He's the program manager uh, for the Cranberry Bog Program at uh, Massachusetts Depart Division of Ecological Restoration, my contact information. Um, and with that, I think I can open it up to questions. All right, thank you, Kate, for that very interesting and thought-provoking presentation about commercial cranberry bogs. So let's get started on the questions and answers. Again, I will be posing your questions uh, and maybe a few of my own that I've received through the Q&A button to the presenter. The most popular questions that have been upvoted to the top will be read first. If you forgot to ask a question or had to leave before the Q&A is over, you can email the presenter at the email address listed on this slide. So let's get started. Uh, so the first question that was posed, Kate, was uh, what is the re reason the farmers abandoned the box? I think it has to do with uh, economics and the price of land in Massachusetts. So when you think regionally about where we are, we're in Freetown, you're about an hour's drive uh, north to Boston. So that real estate is very valuable and cranberries are not a very, um, they're not a cash crop. So in North America, we primarily eat cranberries for one holiday for Thanksgiving um, and cranberries just aren't really eaten at other times of year. Um, I also know that cranberries are being grown in Wisconsin, and I think internationally cranberries are starting to be grown in areas where maybe the cost of living is a little bit lower. And so it's just not profitable for farmers to uh, farm for cranberries and still pay really high taxes. Okay. What platform did you use directly to directly enter the data in the field? Arc Explorer, Survey123? So uh, I've used Arc Explorer uh, and it works best if you have an internet connection. Uh, we used an iPad and we used, um, we directly inputted it into a spreadsheet. So we used Google Sheets because I knew I wanted to use Google Maps platform. Um, one thing that I didn't mention in that map of the transects that, do I still, I don't have control anymore, but um, the map of the transects, those 13 different transects, if you click, on the transect, you can get to the to the data. Um, here, let me flip through. I'm not on the right screen. You can get to the, each individual transect data, and then um, look at the entire spreadsheet. So, um, yeah, that's what we used. Okay. What was the rationale for collecting the vegetation data in November outside the growing season? That's an excellent question. Um, and I sort of touched on it a little bit in the limitations of the study. We weren't able to go out in the growing season in 2019 because of Tripoli West Nile virus. Um, but it's a mosquito borne disease and um, the state agency was uncomfortable with having us as contractors go out and potentially you know, getting sick from mosquitoes. So, 
I still wanted to be able to identify sedges and some of those late flowering. Um, I mean, you just can't identify a sedge unless it's got a flower on it. And that's a lot of what was out here. So although it wasn't ideal, I definitely would have preferred to be out there in September instead of November. Um, we just had to deal with the constraints of the contract. And so then getting out in spring of 2020 under COVID conditions was even more, I was really wanted to get back out there in the spring um, to get some of these flowering species. Like we wouldn't have gotten lance leaf violet if we hadn't gone out in the spring. And that turned out to be a crucial sort of plant for a lot of wildlife on site. Um, so the rationale was, was outside of my control in a perfect world, we would have had better data collection. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question posed, it says, are the data that were used for C and WC ranges broken out by uh, RERAM, RI, RAM categories pulled across the wetland community types? Or are they specific, for example, only to bogs and sphagnum, dominated slash acidic conditions or and communities? If um, the answer to that is, is, is both. So the graphic that I showed in the presentation was just freshwater wetlands in general. So not specific. Um, and that's from published data. It's Forrester and Kutcher and Forrester 2018. But I also have access to unpublished data um, that looked specific at acidic fens and bogs. Um, and if you, you know, one of those in, in writing, like Aaron just send me an email and I can I can get that to you. But the unpublished data um, really just show, we had a little bit of out, outlier in that um, our hydrologically impacted wetlands were pretty high above the charts in terms of uh, CC and mean CC value because I think they were being compared to just wetlands in general and not least disturbed fens and bogs. But when you look at this unpublished data, it's like, okay, no, they're, they're definitely on that scale. And then remind us again, what are the plans for restoration of each farm cell? So I didn't really talk very much about that. You didn't miss it. Um, it's going to be a, a combination of wetland restoration techniques. Mass DER has done a number of cranberry bog restorations and they're still sort of refining their methods. But in general, filling all of these linear ditches, so all of these parallel lines and all of the perimeter ditches um, to get to remove the permanently flooded water regime and get a water regime that is more intermittently exposed. And then also breaking up this sand layer. So I mentioned earlier, there's like two to three feet of sand from decades of farming every year, a new layer of sand was put down. And so the restoration technique is to take a backhoe, plunge it down into the sand layer, plunge it down into the roots. Um, cranberry mats can have like a pretty substantial root mass, plunging it down in, lifting it up, roughening up that surface, creating micro topography within the, the the um, the farmer the former bog cell growing area, and then also removing many of the culverts that Millbrook flows under. Um, right now, the batter boards that created that impoundment there's still like a little bit of a a leap, so it's not fully a passable to aquatic organisms. So it's a little bit of like a dam removal almost, and then also a little bit of like roughening up the soil um, physically creating like more, making it complex. Right now it's all very smooth and, or there's a ditch. Okay. Uh, is sphagnum present on site or in nearby bogs? Uh, are bryophyte transfer techniques being considered to restore some cells such as those in Eastern Canada? Um, so the answer is yes, but there's not a whole lot of sphagnum. Um, the sphagnum was conf uh, confined to the, the ditches, uh, primarily the internal ditches and, and less so the external ditches. Um, but if you look at the, the wetland to the west and to the south, the Atlantic White Cedar Swamp, there's a lot of uh, natural sphagnum, good species diversity in there. 
Um, I do know that one of the goals of mass DER is to get a really robust sphagnum because in their mind, if you can get sphagnum to grow, then it's only a matter of time before you get a really, a really pristine wetlands. Um, but that's a tricky one. And I think, I'm not sure how much success they've had at other sites with getting sphagnum to grow because it's pretty finicky. Um, that might be an excellent question for Alex though. His contact information is, is at the end of the slideshow. Great, thank you. Let's see, is there concern that using the road dike material as fill for the outer ditches might create an area for invasives to establish? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that's why DER was so concerned with knowing where the, the invasives are now and understanding what species they are so that they can control for them. In general, the, the road fill was just clean sand. Um, they, they used what they had in the uplands um, and I don't think they, they trucked in any new fill to, to create these roads. These roads were created probably hundreds of years ago. Um, maybe not hundreds, but you know, 150 years ago. Um, but yeah, that's definitely, anytime you do a wetland restoration, invasives are a concern. And the nice thing about this site is that it is used recreationally by members of the public. And there's definitely opportunities for folks to um, maybe be watchdogs and, and catch early infestations before they get out of hand. Uh, will perimeter ditches be completely filled or just st strategic plugs? Last I saw of the restoration plan, I, that question was still up in the air about the perimeter ditches um, being completely filled. And I think they hadn't fully decided. So I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question, but Alex will know the answer to that question. So ask him. Okay. Uh, did you find any rare or threatened species on site? So we didn't find any rare plants. Um, we definitely had a reference of Massachusetts rare plants. We even you know, had our laminated front and back because they're rare plants and I wanted to make sure that we identified them correctly. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't rare, rare pla plants on site, especially in the non-farmed area. That's where I would expect them to be. Um, it, I wouldn't necessarily expect a rare plant to be in an area that was, you know, mown where sand was placed uh, over the years. But we do know that rare plants are present in the bioreserve. I just didn't see any. Okay. Can you please explain what is the difference between farmed and not farmed cranberry bog from the hydrology standpoint or from the hydrology point of view? That's a really good question. Okay, so a farmed cranberry bog is firm. It's sand. You can stand on it. If you pound a stake, sometimes you'll get a quake from the deep peat that's buried underneath. Prior to my wetland vegetation assessment, DER had contracted, and I don't know the technology that they used. It was ground penetrating sonar or radar. I, I think it might have been sonar where they were able to map the buried peat layers underneath the sand layer. So they knew generally it involved rolling like this big drum over the, 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 the bog surface and, and trying to, which is difficult when plants are growing when you've got saplings and shrubs. So they know where the, 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 the peat was on site. So, but in general, if you'll go to a commercially farmed cranberry bog, it's going to be solid. It's going to be sandy uh, and you're, all you're going to see is cranberry, which is that, that small vine. If you go out and you go to a natural bog area, now there's a couple different types, but uh, in our region in southeastern Massachusetts, you can get a floating bog, which can creep in from the edges of like a water body, for example, if you have a pool in an Atlantic white cedar swamp and you know over millennia you can get creeping sphagnum you can get leather leaf that helps to support the sphagnum really really deep layers of peat not a very strong surface it's um it's saturated for the entire growing season so it never really dries out if you get a drought the whole bog just kind of 
floats back floats down and if you get a flood the whole bog just kind of saturates and come back comes back up um, so you never really have standing water at the surface for any portion of the growing season it's always saturated and it's very quaky and unstable you get things like pitcher plants sundew those types um, growing in it so they're two really very different wetland types thank you what kind of pushback from stakeholders do you think you will encounter when you try to restore this area? Well, this is a uh, popular recreation area. A um, lot of hikers, a lot of bird watchers. And I think having those people who use the site recreationally, especially those folks that are environmentally minded, having them give input onto the wetland restoration is going to be really important. Um, if you get your stakeholders to be part of the planning process early on, then that's when I find that projects go the most smooth. Okay. All right, so we have a few more questions left, at least 14, uh, but we're getting toward the end of time here. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up. Uh, if you wanna pose your question, you can send it directly to Kate at her email address listed there on the slide. Uh, so thank you, Kate, for taking the time out of your busy schedule and during this strange time in history. Uh, to share your expertise and insights with the wetland community around the world. So before we sign off, I have a couple of announcement, announcements to make on upcoming SWS events. Uh, our next SWS webinar will be held on March 18th, 2021, and will be presented by Ellen Hartig, who will be presenting her work on urban wetland initiatives, increasing resiliency of New York City salt marshes. Our next Spanish SWS webinar will be held on March 24th, 2021, and will be, will be presented by Valera Souza speaking about the history of biodiversity origin and humanity future for the Cuatros Cienegas wetlands. As a reminder, all the Spanish webinars are offered free of charge to members and non-members alike. And finally, be sure to subscribe or follow SWS social media channels like Facebook and LinkedIn to keep informed about and support the society. If you are not a member, please check out our webpage at SWS.org and find out how to become one and get all the benefits of the membership uh, in SWS. We also have a YouTube channel where all of our webinars are posted three months after their original broadcasts with multilingual subtitles. And Newly added over the past year are wetlands interviews. Uh, so far we have two in English and three in Spanish. They are posted on our YouTube page. You can quickly link to those on the SWS website under the resources tab and select wetland interviews. If you are Spanish speaking, be certain to subscribe to the Latin America and Caribbean regions Facebook page uh, at the link listed here. Thanks again to today's presenter, uh, to our web webinar sponsors, um, and don't forget that we are still looking for two new sponsors for our 2021 webinar series. And thank you to our audience for participating today. Have a wonderful day and everyone stay well. <laughs>